Hey guys, welcome to Galatians chapter 4. So in this one, we're going to continue on the thought of chapter 3, how Paul ended it. And what he talked about is the schoolmaster and how the law was like a schoolmaster. Like we've said in the other videos, make sure you watch it in order. Galatians, or part 1 of Galatians 1 to 2, and then our part 2 of Galatians 3, and then this part now where you're at. Make sure you watch it in order, otherwise it's not going to make sense. All right, so let's jump right in. We're going to go on with this idea of the schoolmaster. And Paul is going to reiterate um, this for us in a interestingly little bit of a different way. Mm -hmm. So we read the following Galatians 4 verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though his, he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way also, we, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we may receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So Paul explains this in an interesting way. And he makes the example of when you have a, you know, let's just say you have parents and you're their son and that your parents have servants as well. And as long as you are under the house, in the house of your parents, you will be, even though you're a son, you will still be like those servants because you will still be told what to do just like they were. And he says, this is how we are. We are before we came to Christ. We were under the elementary principles of the world. Now, this is important because these elementary principles of the world is not the law of God as in God's word or how obedience to his word. No, he is talking about Remember, we're talking about pagans here, Gentile pagans, yes. or people who weren't um, the Galatians, who weren't familiar with God's word before they came to him. They were familiar with elementary principles of the world, the worldly things. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying you guys were there, even though, you know, you were sons, you were still there. You were in bondage to those things. And then he says, but when the fullness of time had come, God did send forth his son. Mm -hmm. And now you were, you were received as adopt, you were adopted in a way, and you became part of him. You were then set free from those elementary principles of the world. He says to redeem those who were under the law. Now, what does it mean to be under the law? You know, we can just think about it this way. If you, are you under a law when you break it or when you're obedient to it? When you're driving down the street with your car and there's a stop street and you stop there, are you held under the law? No, because you're, you're obedient. But when you run through that stop street, now a cop stops you and now you're held under the law and he drags you before a judge and you're held under the law. The, the judge now has this authority over you. So you're only under the law when you are guilty of breaking it. But those of us who are now in Christ are not under the law because we are not guilty. He makes us innocent and clean because and now the law has no. Now it's like being dragged before a judge, but there's nothing to be accused of because he took the punishment of the law, the curse of the law upon himself. And that's so important, that key under the punishment, under the curse of the law. That's why we read earlier in chapter three, how Christ took upon himself the curse, the punishment right. of the law, which is the wages of sin is death. He took that punishment, that, that punishment of death upon himself. Like if you were taken before the judge, he took that punishment that you rightly deserve upon himself. It doesn't mean that once you get out of the judge, you know, once you go out of court, you can just go right back to speeding down the streets and breaking the stuff. No, of course not. You're grateful. Right. That he took that punishment and now you want to keep the law because you're so grateful. Like Paul says, do we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who mm. are dead to sin, dead still to breaking the law, yeah. still live that way? Mm. Amen. Paul continues. Galatians 4.8 
Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months, seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Now, this is very important because, you know, people have thought and said that when Paul talks about why do you want to turn back to these weak and elementary principles yeah. of the world? These beggarly elements. Oh, those, yeah. those, that, law, that yeah. law of God, that's the beggarly elements he's talking about. Like, did God give us worthless elements, principles of the world? Yeah. No, no. No. Are we calling God's law worthless elementary principles of the world? Abs is Paul yeah. calling God's law that absolutely not? Or weak? Because he, told, no. he, he called it weak as well. No. no. The, God didn't give us something weak and worthless. Mm -mm. What Paul is talking about is what he said in the previous verse. Context is important. And previous verses. We just read earlier how he talked about the worthless elementary principles of the world. And now he talks about again, you were enslaved to those who were not gods. You thought they were gods, but they were false gods. They didn't need, there was no other yeah, god but you one. You came out of paganism. Oh. And so in paganism, you worship false gods that were not gods. And right. you were enslaved to those worthless elementary principles of paganism. And they were under the law. Hmm. And because they were in sin, they were without Christ. That means the law has, we're, we're gonna now has ability to exercise that, that curse, if you will, because they were breaking it over and over and over. And so now, when they were dragged before that, that, that law, that judge, if you will, the law has got authority. The law says you are sinners mm -hmm. and you are guilty of sin and you will go, you're going to go to Gehenna, right? Mm -hmm. But now he's saying, no, you have come to Christ. Now you, are, you need to toss aside those beggarly, worthless things you were part of when you come to Christ. And now the law will have no, that curse of the law mm -hmm. will not be able to come. Um, over you anymore. And when Paul says, don't, how can you turn back again to these worthless elements? Is he saying, just don't go back to worshiping those false gods? Because of course, you know, the context of this, this book is the, the people that came in saying, you must be circumcised to be saved. You must have that, that works salvation. Right. And that is the foundation of all these other false religions. There's no relationship. There's no faith. There was no Yeshua that came and died for your sins and all these different you know, religions. It's that works relationship. And he's saying, don't return to that sort of works relationship mindset where you can do it in yourself. You can become your own right. mini God because you have to be so perfect and holy that not you are your own salvation because of your works. Right. You can't. Exactly. All the other religions are about what we can do for those gods. But this God of the Bible is about what he has done for us. Mm -hmm. That's the key. And so now we get to this verse that has been used because now he says thereafter, you observe days and months and years and seasons. I'm afraid I labor for you in vain. And people th say that, hey, he's talking about the Sabbath. Yeah. He's talking about the feast days, God's Sabbath, God's feast days, God's time reckoning of time. Mm -hmm. And we can't keep those things because those are the beggarly elements. No, 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 no. no. What, what he is talking about here again is these worthless pagan things. Because, newsflash, the pagans have seasons. The pagans have feast days too. The pagans have, it's actually a massive thing in paganism. That's where things like Halloween comes from. The whole idea of the, the changing of seasons, right? And how all these things, right? It was, it's big in paganism. Talk to any pagan and they'll tell you. Right. So, so he's saying stop observing these pagan months because they would associate each month with a pagan god. Mm -hmm. They would associate seasons with pagan gods and worship their gods. And that No, he's saying mm -hmm. turn from those things. Turn back to Christ. And now in the following verses, Paul is really pleading with the Galatians that he's writing to to turn away from this, this paganism and this work salvation mindset. Mm -hmm. So reading on Galatians 4.12. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as even Yeshua Messiah. 
What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until a Messiah is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed with you. And now, following this pleading cause that he's giving them, he's telling them, please turn, don't, don't go this way. Have I labored for you in vain? And then he comes and he gives us this example of Sarah and Hagar. And he, he uses it symbolically to talk about the, the covenant that we've discussed in the previous um, teaching of yes. Galatians here. That covenant of Mount Sinai uh, and so on. So to understand this story, okay, this is this is huge, guys. Very, very huge. Very few people actually really understand what Paul is about to say here. This is so key. Okay, he's he's gonna then to know what he's saying, you need to know what he knew. Okay, to know what he is explaining, you need to understand what he knows because he knows the Torah well. He knows the story of the Torah, that what we call the Old Testament Torah and prophets, very well. And he knows the story of, of um, Hagar and Sarah and Abraham and what happened there well. It's not really hard to understand though if we know the story. But people don't know the story, so then they start drawing their own conclusions, right? So using eisegesis instead of exegesis, reading the context right. of the scripture that's given to us. So they read things into the text that just isn't there. But if you know what he knows, you'll understand. So let's look at it that way. Okay, in verse 21, he says this. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. All right, so what happened in the story of Hagar and Sarah? Well, we have the story of how God comes to Abraham and promises that you, that Sarah will bear a son. Mm. Okay, but this is a big deal because Sarah is old of age and it's really hard for them to see how she is going to be bearing, bringing forth the son. Mm. And so the year, the time really goes by and it doesn't happen. Like it, it seems to Abraham and Sarah that this promise of God is not going to happen. Mm. And they start thinking, well, we want this promise of God to happen. We believe in the promise, but we just don't really believe in the way that God is going to bring it forth. They don't believe that it's going to happen through now through um, Sarah becoming pregnant, because for them, that's inconceivable to happen. So what they do is they get Abraham gets a Hagar and he t goes with Hagar and gets a child with Hagar, the slave woman. And now they want to use the slave son, the son born from slavery out of through the slavery through Hagar. And we, they want to use that son to bring forth this promise that was given to Abraham, this promise of right, this promise of actually bringing salvation to the whole world even. And so really what we are seeing and then we see God coming and saying, what have you done, guys? Why don't you trust me? And then he lets Sarah have the child and. Sarah, the child of promise comes through Sarah and through that line is even where we have now everything else come through, including Messiah and all the other descendants. So now here's the thing. The big distinction is the big difference between Sarah and Hagar is this. 
um, Hagar, they try to use Hagar, they try to bring forth God's promise by their own works. Mm. They try to bring forth God's promise by what their their plans are, what they can do. By their own flesh. By their own flesh. That's why I said that was the by the flesh, but this is the one of promise is Sarah by the promise of God. That is how the true one can come forth. That is like by the promise of Yeshua versus by our own works, our flesh, our ideas, our plans. Mm. Okay, that's what this story really is about. Mm. And now he's using this story to explain to us the, uh, the, this idea. And he is saying that these can be interpreted allegorically. He says the one woman is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. And then he says the other woman is Sarah. She is the one who brings the child of promise forth. Now, many can then think, okay, well, that means that Mount Sinai, that covenant and the laws of Mount Sinai are all laws of um, slavery, right? And and those laws are bad for us. Those laws are not of God's plan. And But that doesn't make sense because God gave them. How are they not God's plan, right? How are they? How would they be bad for us if God gave them? Is uh, Would God give us something that's a burden and bad? Right. No. So you need to understand what does he mean by Mount Sinai? Okay, because he says this. He says something amazing. He says, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. Okay. For she is in slavery for children. Mm. The present Jerusalem. When Paul was writing this, and even today, this it hasn't changed, in fact. Mm. The present Jerusalem, there is a lot of slavery. Because Why? Is it because the law is slavery? No. Not at all. It is because what was given to be good was turned into something that becomes slavery. Mm. Because when you use the law of God to bring forth salvation, it becomes slavery. And that's what happened in Jerusalem. They threw out Messiah. They don't want Messiah. They thought their own works, law, works of the law can bring forth their salvation. Right. That is slavery. So we, it's, it's actually twofold. We have... We can have um, keeping God's law for the wrong reason. That is to bring forth salvation, be slavery. Mm-hmm. Or it can be when we try and use other ideas and things, even pagan ideas and customs like the golden calf. Right. Like the golden calf. What happened also at Mount Sinai? They were given, you know, the, Moses was coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. God was giving forth his, his law of life. Right. But what do they do? Oh, Moses is gone. We don't have the trust that he will come back. Oh, well, let's make a plan. We'll mix a plan B. We'll just like just like Abraham and yeah. Sarah. Let's make a plan. Let's get Hagar. Right. Let's let's create our own promise when we'll create Ishmael. They created the golden calf. And what happened when they created that? 3,000 died because of their rebellion, mm. because they chose to create their own promise out of their own works, out of their own flesh. But now we have this, this wonderful contrast. contrast. Mm. In Acts 2, what happened when they accepted through faith, through the Holy faith Spirit? alone. Yes, that 3,000 came to salvation. 3,000 came into the covenant. Instead and they of were 3, baptized. Died. Yes, 3,000 that were mm. baptized into faith, into Yeshua, because they accepted on faith. Just like the example of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. Sarah, the, the promise of Isaac, that they all mm. they had to accept through faith and wait. Or they could create to their works, right. a false version or Ishmael. Right. So, brothers and sisters, do you see now that when he speaks about Mount, Mount Sinai, he's not saying what God did at Mount Sinai is bad. Mm-hmm. He's not saying what God gave at Mount Sinai, that covenant, Sinai covenant is bad. The Mosaic covenant is bad. No, he's not saying that. He's saying rather what we have done with it is. Mm-hmm. What we have tried to use it for is bad because he never intended it to be used. To bring about salvation. That was the Abrahamic covenant fulfilled in Yeshua. That was a, the salvational covenant. The Mosaic covenant was the, what do we now do to, to walk more like he did? How do we walk in this holiness? How do we walk in a way that's pleasing to him? It's like, um, you know, how do I love Christina better? You know, what do I need to do? I know what does she like? What does she not like? What, what do I need to change in my life? What are the bad habits I have that really get on her nerves? Okay, these are similar to the Mosaic Covenant. God is telling us what gets on his nerves. What does he not like us to do? What it's is an he, abomination to him. And what is pleasing to him? 
And on top of that, he says, by the way, if you do what is pleasing to me, you will be blessed because these are things that I I programmed into this world that if you eat these things, they will be you will be blessed. If you don't, if you touch these things, you will be cursed. All right. It's like yeah. that kind of thing. And so then in conclusion of chapter four, we read the following. Now, you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So we are not going to be walking by our flesh. Look, our flesh does desire to work out our salvation on our own. Yeah. Our flesh desires to figure it all out like Abraham and Sarah with Hagar. We try and we believe we can believe in this promise of God. We can believe that, yes, there's salvation. God wants salvation for us. But do we believe in the means of bringing about that salvation that he has promised? That's the big key, because it's easy to believe in the salvation, but not always in the means. Do we truly believe in the means? Because if we truly believe in Yeshua as the only way, truth and life, no works that you can do can justify you before God for salvation. Do you truly believe that? Because if you don't, that is going to be slavery. You're going to then struggle with sin more than ever. You're going to be in bondage because it's only when you understand that you are set free by Messiah, that you can trust in him, that he did it right. He accomplished righteousness. And now that righteousness is imputed to me. Now that sin just falls right off me because I'm righteous. There is that empowerment that comes when we believe in him. Right. Like Paul talks about in the book of Romans, the spirit and the flesh are at war with each other and our fleshly nature yeah. rises up and makes us desire to do things that are against God's law, to do sin. Yeah. And that fleshly nature also rises up saying, well, if I just do more good things, I'll be like we, we even see in our culture, our secular culture. Well, I'm a good person, so of course I'm going to heaven because I'm, I'm good. But that's good according to you and good according to you. That every person's good is different. It's not according to the word of God. When we have our flesh dictating what is good or how we can attain salvation because we don't need Yeshua and we can simply do a work. And because of that work, circumcision, which was the topic Paul's directly addressing, be circumcised to be saved. Then what is Yeshua? Mm. We no longer need Yeshua. And Paul talks about that later, which is very dangerous. Yes. And we even see this in the story of Pharaoh, right? Yeah. In the story of Pharaoh, like um, in Egypt, Pharaoh was his own God. That's what they believed, and they believed that Pharaoh was God on earth. So when God gave him all these different um, times where he could come before him and repent and mm. re recognize that this is the true God of heaven and earth, Pharaoh rejected because at the end, he was his own means of salvation. He was his own God. Mm. But Israel, they accepted that free gift of deliverance, and they were saved. Yes. And that's that difference. What was Pharaoh's end? It was death. And so we need to be careful that we reject that Pharaohs in our lives, that, that fleshly nature that says that we, we know best mm -hmm. or that we can work out our own salvation through our works or through doing certain things, but that no, we need to accept that free gift of deliverance that God gives through faith. And then we walk it out in and our it, faithfulness. And it takes true humility to do this. It takes true humility to be able mm -hmm. to admit to yourself and others that without God, I am wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I mm. cannot save myself. I am not good enough. Right. I fail every day. I need to trust in him to pick me up every day. And when you live in that place, there's real freedom in that, in that he, you actually find yourself being empowered and you will have more grace on others as well. Mm. Just like Yeshua, even him, even though he was righteous, he had grace on others. Right. right. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us in this video on Galatians chapter four. And we hope you will join us for our next video as we continue in the book of Galatians. Blessings and Shalom. And see you in Galatians five. Shalom.